you realized you would not be going back? Is that what happened? Yeah, that's true. And, and I realized I, I just couldn't take this. And I served in the Army. The Army was called the People's Army. You know, every, the first principle was to serve and protect the people, defend yeah. the people. Now the whole thing was reversed, and I just c couldn't serve a, a brutal government like that. All the schools at the time were state-owned. Yeah. So I, I just can't, I, I wouldn't do that. I uh, see. And also my son, after that, my son arrived. The first thought to me was that he must be American. I don't. I wanted him to get out of the cycle of suffering, and that's why I want him to grow up in this country, to take this country as his country. Yeah. Um, you have in many of your works. Um, I'm thinking of. Uh, waiting or trash, mm -hmm. your most recent novel, *The Crazed*. Mm -hmm. You deal with the idea of home. Yes. Um, home is something often that the hero or the narrator is mm -hmm. away from yes. and yearns for, but is yes. dangerous. And yes. I wonder if that is. Do you view China that way for yourself? Is it still? Does it have a resonance of home for you? And do you feel a kind of homesickness? Uh, in the beginning, yes. I, th I think first twelve years, uh, yes, a lot of. Home sickness, but I couldn't have my passport renewed. I couldn't travel outside of the states. Um, but once I became a citizen, that desire was gone. I was numbed. I think I was numbed. Uh, I, I think home, yeah, is a big uh, subject. Perhaps consciously or unconsciously, uh, I put it in into my work. Uh, you're right about the longing for home. We're often. People tend to view home as a, a, a fixed entity that doesn't change. But home, in fact, changes also because we change as human beings. Mm -hmm. And our relationship with home also changes. I think the tragedy in more trash is that many of them, they view home as something there, secure, uh, comfortable, fixed. but. It, Home it's is not fluid. like that. Yeah, it's a fluid thing. So home now has sort of shifted for you. Would you say it has? It is here. Yeah, and at home, I think is also is a, a, a more of a feeling than an object for me. I think we can build our home in a different form. Uh, in our find scientists, perhaps lab or your your own work is your home. When you sit in, I don't know if you write in front of the computer, um, but. Perhaps that is that your most secure and domestic space. I would say the page. The page. The page. You know, my work yeah. on the page. That I feel this is. I understand. Yeah, that. this space is where I can really uh, give everything, uh, where I have kind of freedom. Yeah. <laughs> I think that yes, to be on the page, live on the page. Yeah. To live on the page. Yeah. Um, you write in English, and I guess mm. from what I've read, you've always written in English. Mm -hmm. and not in Chinese. Mm -hmm. um, that seems to me interesting. Uh, is that true? And does that include both your poetry as well as your prose? Because I think of poetry, particularly Chinese poetry, as being so rich and having such a tradition. And I know you're a poet mm -hmm. as well as a fiction writer. Do you ever write in Chinese? Or is, it, uh, is, is your writing life entirely in English? Uh, I think basically English. I do write short essays, articles, and or an introduction sometimes in Chinese. Uh -huh. um, sometimes I translate a poem into Chinese. Uh -huh. And my wife and I, uh, in fact, translated a, my first book, Ocean Words, uh, into Chinese. Uh, but Chinese is, is secondary. I view myself primarily a uh, writer in the English language. Mm. Your, your style is extremely precise and even minimalist, I would say, mm. um, spare. Do you think there's any relationship between your style and the fact that you're writing in your second language? Or sure. do you think that your style is, a, is just your personal aesthetic, part of your character, or whatever? Uh, of course, I think, yes. Of mm -hmm. course, it's related to the fact that this is my second language. Mm -hmm. And um, I can't have the kind of spontaneity. None of these writers who write in the second language has that kind of uh, spontaneity that c cannot be acquired. For instance, Nabokov and Conrad, they are all mannered, but they are superb stylists. So you have, in other words, a writer of my situation 
has advantages to advantages also some disadvantages so you feel you are a stylist uh, perhaps because you're writing in a second language but there's a lack of spontaneity or um, fluidity there as a result fluidity can be worked out yeah. can, can be acquired the spontaneity is a hard thing for uh -huh. instance dialogue natural speech none of these writers really depend on that but what American it, writer do you feel has that quality that you... A lot of uh, yeah. Roth, uh, Barlow, okay. uh, um, Paley, um, a lot, lot of, uh, yeah. lot of uh, Americans have, have, have that kind of uh, uh, spontaneity. But on the other hand, uh, there are a lot of uh, you know, other advantages uh, or strengths, possibilities. I think uh, for a writer, for my situation, style is vital, really try to develop a style suitable to the story. Uh, and by that I mean also try to bring a different kind of sensibility to the literature. Uh, and also I think uh, try to be precise and more rational, elegant in a different way. In other words, there are different, how to make the language slightly different, not like the native speakers. So that little divergence yes. from, well, that leads me into another thing I note mm -hmm. about your writing. It has a, I, I don't mean this, I mean this in mm -hmm. a positive way. Mm -hmm. There's an anthropological quality sometimes mm -hmm. in your writing where um, we see, we learn things about mm -hmm. another culture that mm -hmm. we didn't know. Um, mm -hmm. I'm thinking, for example, of the bridegroom, where mm -hmm. you, the, the, the take on homosexuality as mm -hmm. seen through the lens of this provincial Chinese society is so yes. different from anything we would know here. Yes, yes. And I wonder if, um, while you write, you ever think, oh, this would be really interesting to American or European readers, something mm -hmm. they wouldn't know. Mm -hmm. Does that ever pass through your mind as you write? Uh, sure. You know, there's a space there between the two languages and two cultures, uh, something uh, that is already jaded to another language, but it can be fresh to another. Uh, but I, when can easily abuse this space, the yeah. this privileged position. That's why I always take translatability as a standard. That means once my work is translated back into Chinese, the Chinese reader, they must find it interesting and authentic. So that's the way to prevent myself from abusing this privilege. Of being simply the, the interesting, eccentric yes, storyteller. So just depend yeah. on novelty. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, I hear that you are now working on a novel set in the United States, your first. <laughs> yes, um, the big could you <laughs> is, that, is that a particular challenge, and how, how is that going? It has to be, really, everything will be different. Setting yeah. different, the characters different, and even the manner of speech will be different, very yeah. different. And so for me, it is really a, a different kind of beginning. Very hard, uh, I don't know whether it will work, but all I can do is, is to try. So you feel you're at the stage now where you feel the need to write an American novel. Sure, yeah, yeah, I've been here almost 20 years. Is uh, it that long? Yes, yeah. and, <laughs> and also I, I, China has been remote now. I, I'm yeah. not familiar with the current China, and it also is my heart is not there, honestly. Yeah. I feel yeah. the American experience is closer to my heart. Um, you've made the, the point that to be a writer, you have to have a sense of hopelessness. Sure. Um, yeah. A sense of failure. Yes. <laughs> I find that a very <laughs> resonant <laughs> remark. Yeah. Could you elaborate a little bit on that? Yes, I, there are two, I think, it, okay. First, if we imagine, imagine our work in the context of the work, uh, all the works written before the, our own work, and they, we can easily see how insignificant <laughs> our writings are. Uh, in that sense, in the end, there's only failure. <laughs> and also there's a, a, on the... What do you mean by failure, exactly? It means you can't write anything better. You can't produce any really <laughs> meaningful, very significant work. Very yeah. often what you've been doing is doomed in the, from the very beginning. Uh, so we just try our best. So that is kind of failure. Another way I think many writers, we write because we, we can't do anything else. 
I would agree with that, absolutely. <laughs> uh, that's kind of, so it, that's kind of depressing, isn't yes, it? Yes, yes, and yeah. this is the way to spend your life. On the page you feel alive. It's something you can manage. You feel this is a way to spend your, uh, to exist yeah. on the page. So in that sense, there's this kind of failure, right? You, you retreat to the page. So you <laughs> feel it's an alternative to actually living? Yeah, on some I do level. believe that, yes. Yeah. yeah. I, I, as a writer <laughs> myself, I will say that I think there's a lot of truth in that. Yeah. Also, the aspect of, the compulsive aspect of writing, do you find that, that you're compelled to write? Yes, sometimes. Yeah. It's al almost like a sickness. <laughs> <laughs> we should compare our two pathologies <laughs> here. Uh, yeah, sometimes, yes, you just want yeah. to write as if there's something you really you enjoy doing. On the other hand, there's real life there. Right, I think in the story by Kafka, the hunger artist, at the last, you know, they bring in the tiger. The tiger is bursting with life. That's real life, full of energy and the spirit. But the, the artist is dying, and he's breaking his record. Nobody knows, even himself doesn't know the meaning of his performance. I think that is a true situation. Um, your latest novel, War Trash, mm -hmm. which I just finished, actually, mm -hmm. and I found extraordinary, as I told you before, um, it deals with a, a mainland Chinese man who mm -hmm. is uh, taken captive during the Korean War mm -hmm. by nationalist and American forces. And you deal with this, I think, in complex moral terms mm -hmm. with respect to war and with respect to patriotism, too. Mm -hmm. um, what caused you to decide to write this novel, and could you tell us a little bit about the research that was involved in writing it? It was, you know, it started uh, for pretty practical reason. I had mm -hmm. manuscript. The bridegroom, in fact, was mm -hmm. um, on contract with Zoland Books, and, but I didn't have the man whole manuscript. But they didn't have it either, and but they wanted to w go ahead and publish the book anyway because waiting had just. W Got in the National Book Award. They wanted to take advantage of the situation, um, but I, I I wanted them to wait, but they wouldn't. In order to replace the manuscript, my wife suggested that I write a short novel, a, a complete thing, mm -hmm. to uh, substitute that uh, for that. And so I went ahead and wrote the first draft of, of the novel. Originally, I thought it would be like 150 pages long. Once I started, I couldn't stop. And it went on and on. The first draft was more than 400 pages. And what was it that, that drew you in to this particular part? See, that's the thing. I, I, then I, I was puzzled. Later, I realized, realized there was a fear. Because when I was a young soldier uh, on the, Russia and the, the Russian and Chinese border, we were afraid of captivity more than death because we had seen the POWs. I they see. returned to China humiliated and treated as semi-criminals. That was fascinating to mm. me that a, a POW is treated as yeah. is, is a shameful mm -hmm. thing. It's sharp China. contrast to American <laughs> way. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. so that that fear was in you and, yes. and propelled you to write Yes, and then there was kind of cathartic experience. And then well, after I had the first draft, I could see all the gaps and the holes in the manuscripts. And I also realized this was too good for uh, Zola and the books. <laughs> and so I had to slow down. This was a serious work. And so I began to do research and began to read a lot of uh, memoirs and articles. And Books on the subject. It's so replete with information about the period and about the details of what it must have been like in that situation, which I assume you got from your. your yes, research, yes. Yeah. Sometimes you know, I, from, in some cases, I got two or three details from one book, mm -hmm. but I hate to let people think you know I stole from them. So I just, that's why I gave it a bibliography. I yeah. could see this detail from that book, that detail from the other book. Yeah. Just want to be honest. Well, it's a wonderful work, and I, I really uh, enjoyed reading it. I well, think thank you. others will, too. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I want to thank you, Ha Jin, for joining us today at the Drexel Interview. Thank you. It's a pleasure. And thank you for joining us at the Drexel Interview.